Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Happy to be here. The way that this goes, if you can please just tell us real quick who you are, who you work with, and then kick it off with kind of what you want to talk about today. And sure. we'll dive right in. I'm Ann Brady. I'm a full-time college professor in kinesiology, and then I'm obviously an online fitness coach. I primarily work with women midlife, so kind of what I say is like a pivotal decade, um, helping to get them strong, moving well with at-home workouts. Cool. What are we talking about today? I think the biggest thing I struggle with right now is working full-time, yeah. trying to grow a business, and figuring out where to best spend my time um, to grow and work on my business, not in my business. Okay. And I think my, you know, my interests, obviously, with my coaching and my being a professor in kinesiology, they're very related. And so I want to be able to leverage the skills and knowledge I already have to help me grow my business. But it's a struggle, I think, working full time. So figuring out where to spend my time, where to be efficient, that's the hard part. It's hard. It's a hard problem to overcome, which is why most people don't, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing I'll say is, yeah, it's hard. It's not supposed to be easy trying to do something that's going to fundamentally shift your position and help you almost like, like I picture it as like a quantum leap to the next level of, of where you want to be at means that you have to do a lot of stuff that's proactive that doesn't quite return today. And so where and how do you fit that in? So talk to me about what your days are like then, because you're a full-time professor. What restrictions does that, I mean, restrictions, it's not really restriction. What does that mean for your time day to day? And then is there other stuff personally that also takes up time? Yeah, my role is different. Um, so I run an exercise program on campus. Okay. And so again, I'm doing a lot of the same things face-to-face -face that I'm doing online, which is helpful. But I'm at the gym 6 a.m. three days a week. And then I try to leave those days, leave the office by about one. And then the other days I'm in typical kind of eight o'clock and work until about two. And I've got two kids. I'm married. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And so I pick them up from school at 2.50. Yeah. And then we're, you know, hitting the road for activities and sports and all the other things as a family. 2.50? So it's quite busy. Yeah. That's when I usually leave, leave the house. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then in the mornings, like like the morning that you start at 8 a.m., are you with the kids um, that morning? How does that work? I am. I mean, my husband's home too, but yeah. I'm with kids. I get up at 4.30 every day. Um, so those days I don't go in. I get up, do my workouts. Yeah. And then my husband does drop off. I do pickup every day. So he takes them to school mm, and then I okay. do the pickups in the afternoons. Cool. And then after 2.50, you're basically done until bedtime, like you're, like you're with them till bedtime? Um, I try to be. I'm not good at that. So that's that's another thing with boundaries is it's um, probably dividing my time too much to try to be fully present with my kids, not be working, um, whether it's, you know, answering student emails or answering client emails. Mm -hmm. um, so I do mix some of those. I've gotten better, especially since I joined OTM at not working at night. So yeah. I've just gotten more efficient. I've streamlined my process a lot more so I don't work at night. I do work on the weekends, and so I'll do two to three hours, um, usually one day a week or one day on the weekend. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you have to, right? If yep. you, if you want to, if you want to make this work, it sounds like you have to, you know, finish it at right. one or two o'clock, and then picking up your kids at two fifty. Like, there's not a lot of other options. Okay, so when have you been fitting in? Call it the OTM work. Uh, the the call it the other. When have you been fitting in the other uh, right yeah. now? Well, I joined OTM in April, and so that was perfect because the university was winding down. I was finishing that stuff. Mm -hmm. I still work in the summer, but a lot less, and so that was great. Right. So I built up my coaching business. I mean, I've been coaching online since 2021, but the progress was super slow, which is why I joined OTM, mm -hmm. and it's gotten much better. And so I had a lot more free time over the summer. Now yeah. that I'm back full time, this is where the crunch is. I'm kind of like, okay, like it's just different being back to this new routine. The summer I had a lot more flexibility. Yeah. So it's hard now. I mean, I'm fitting it in where I can, but it's pockets of time. Um, I'm trying to time block. That's a little bit harder when, you know, the university, I'm not, I'm not working much when I'm at school. 
Um, so it's it's fitting it in in the evenings, some evenings, some afternoons, and then weekends. And you you with people always. So that six to one or eight to two, you with people like on the gym floor that whole time. No, I'm not. No. So the program is six. It's six in the morning to eight thirty in the morning. So it's just short. And oh, then I'm okay. Teaching classes. Um, I run an internship program. So okay. that I have more flexibility. So that's where I'll sometimes um, work in a call. Like I had an enrollment call this morning. Yeah. So I have some flexibility, but I also just need to be careful that I'm also getting all my other work done with my my university job. So there's a few things here I think could be interesting to discuss. One is the difference between like on times and in between times, and how important it is to differentiate between the two, it, both to figure out how to spend our time and what to focus on, but also just to make us not feel as guilty right. when we're in an in-between time, knowing that there is going to be on times that we can prepare for. So I'd love to talk about that. But I've also loved to talk about like the different tasks right in in what you do. And normally when we have this conversation, it's about, okay, what are you energized by? What are you, uh, what do you really love to do? You know, do you love to do the sales calls? Do you hate to do the sales calls? Do you love to do the programming? Do you hate to do the programming, the content, blah, 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 all the different stuff that has to go into this business. And that's how we start to kind of delineate. Okay. Once we get to the point of scaling, how do you figure out which tasks to offhand? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of mistake that people make when they scale is they start to try to hire somebody. It's like, oh, I need to hire a coach. I need to hire a person. I don't actually think as you're scaling up businesses like this, you don't hire people, you hire off tasks. And choosing which ones and what order you do that in can be really, really important. In your case, um, the decision might be based on something different, though, because the decision for you might be based around, you can tell me if I'm wrong, this is what I'm reading into it, is more based around not the total amount of time that you have, but the restrictions of when you're available and when you're not available. There are some tasks like being available for a sales call, for example, right. where you kind of need to have like a pretty open calendar in order to do that. And so even if you really like doing them, that might be like the first thing to kind of offset, even if it's not done by somebody uh, as good as you, let's say at first, because it's not going to. So. Let's start with that. And then the other conversation is more philosophical, I think. So, <laughs> so let's start Let's start with that. What have you done there in terms of delegating, in terms of hiring out tasks? Anything, something? Where are you at with that? None. None. Zero. Okay. <laughs> okay. And again, part of that is a, I think a lot of us coaches probably feel this way. You're scared to give up control of things. Yeah. I think part of it is I'm still... I'm still growing a lot as a coach. So to mm -hmm. hand off something like enrollment calls, I don't feel like I'm skilled there enough Yeah. Um, just myself. Um, but I agree with you. A lot of it is time restriction. And the sales calls is a really difficult part because I can post whenever I can make content other times. The programming, because that's what I do in my university life. Sure. Programming is easy for me. I love it. It's the the business side of it that's like, it's all new yeah. and trying to learn those skills, like you're saying, and implementing them when they have to be at very specific times. Yeah. Like somebody says that they're available for a call, but they aren't available from 2 to 2.45, you know, in the afternoon. I don't have an answer for you. You know, I don't think my job here is to like give answers necessarily. It's more just processes. So here's kind of how I, um, here's how I go about this. This is actually something my dad showed me. And then I'm going to alter it a little bit for you. Uh, way back when, when I was going my business, my dad was like career, you know, manager, middle manager type person. So he knew all about the kind of struggles of growing the businesses. And it's like an old school employee org chart, but you don't do it for employees. You do it for tasks. And so I'll kind of draw it out here. But, you know, basically our business can be split into three pieces, three major arms. The first is call it like administration customer service. The second is marketing and sales. And the third is client care. So just call it admin, marketing, and then client care. So, you know, put that at the top, right? Super simple. Put them all in a box. 
And then from that, what I'll do is I'll actually just draw lines and I'll start mapping out all of the tasks, like all of the little things that you're kind of doing. And so if we look into, I mean, admin is pretty straightforward, whatever, answering emails, checking on payments, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, That's something that, you know, a VA or somebody could do maybe at some point. But if you're looking at marketing, you're looking at, call it content creation. You're looking at some sort of nurturing sequence, something, right? Whatever, whatever you're doing there. But then you're looking at somebody whose job it is to um, call it accelerate the relationship. So take that person from like content or referral or whatever to a, to a phone call. Mm -hmm. There might be a few different systems in there, but um, so call that for lack of a better word, call that DM setting, which I never liked that term, but it is what it is. DM setting. And then, you know, sales calls. So somebody on the sales call. And so you'll map out everything that you're doing, and it's going to go much deeper than this, but you'll map out everything that you're doing for client care as well. Could be initial program development, could be revising the programs, could be checking on your client's results, every single task. And then what you're going to do is once you have all of the boxes and the empty boxes, you're going to put a name in each one. And guess what name is going to be in every single one to start? <laughs> <laughs> and so the process then, what I love about this is A, it's visual, right? It's a model. It's visual. You're like, okay, this is my entire business. No matter how much this scales, this is going to be my entire business. There might be four people in the sales call bucket at one point. There might be three people in the programming bucket. There might be, you know, like we have a a, a client care representative. We call it a success coach, give whatever name you want. But, But there might be multiple people in those buckets, but like those are the buckets, right? And then you look at that and you, and, and you can then start to work backwards through the process of replacing the names. And what you're looking for is not some unicorn who is as good as you at everything, because that's going to be really hard to find. Instead, what you're looking for is somebody who's really good at that one task. So, for example, you guys all love Drea Maxwell, who's incredible. Drea's background is in retail. She worked at clothing stores. Why do you think she's so damn good at customer service and conversations? So there's a bunch of carryover skills potentially from other industries that if you understand what skills you're looking for, You can start to look at other places, perhaps, in your life where you might know people who are who who demonstrate expertise in those places and bring them in. But if you don't know those skills, it's just kind of a crapshoot. And so for you, and I would I would be looking at this in one of two ways. One is just like, yo, are there things that you know you have to do, but you just hate doing? And as many times as your coach tells you that you need to do them, you just don't want to do them. And most of the time you don't do them, but occasionally you do do them, but you kind of don't really do them that well. And you don't really want to admit it. So that's number one, because we all have that. Like for me, it's anything to do with spreadsheet. The second is things that have um, restrictions built into them probably based off of time, where it's just a massive lever in your business to be able to eliminate that restriction. Like instead of saying, hey, I only have these couple of times for calls this week, you can work on the client schedule a lot more. So that might be things like check-in calls as well. I don't know. Right. Okay. Um, But I would be looking at replacing those first. That's the process for that. In terms of the on-time versus off-time, you're on a very predictable schedule. It's basically in-season, off-season for an athlete. I mean, you know exactly when you should peak. You know exactly when you should taper. You know exactly when you're in-season and you are uh, executing but not looking at actively getting better. And you can predict that well ahead. And so you can plan for that. I actually would look at that as a constraint 
that is very positive. What we find a lot of the time with these businesses is that once people get more successful in them, they start to get beaten down by it because there's no seasonality in it. It just becomes the same thing day after day, the doldrums. It's like, so what? I'm going to like try to get a few more likes today. So what? I'm trying to get a few more phone calls today. Like it kind of becomes the same thing day after day after day after day. And um, that's fine for six months or a year when things are all new and exciting. But can you withstand that for five or 10 or 15 or 20 years? Probably not. And so the seasonality that you have built into your life, I think you can actually work with in a very powerful way, not to grow quicker, faster, more to build in more longevity and sustainability into what you do. And so you have, you know, it's interesting because you have your on season for like your job, right? Yeah, I like I have kinesiology degree, like I understand how it is, right? Like you have your, yep. you, you have your on season for your job, but then you have your uh, on season for almost like your side hustle, which mm-hmm. I mean, I know how much kinesiology professors make, like probably makes more than your job. If not, will be soon. And so it's an interesting kind of mix. But when you're on during school, I don't think it's unreasonable to be okay with being in a, hey, I'm going to execute this day in and day out, and I'm going to prepare for the next leg up. So that's a time to read more, to study more, to practice a lot of the perhaps hard skills, like maybe it's content creation, maybe it's hiring. Knowing that you're going to have your reading week, you're going to have your holidays, you're going to have your long summers, where that's going to be a time where you're going to be on season, right? Where you're going to be peaking. I mean, and that's exactly why I didn't join OTM sooner Mm -hmm. was because I wanted to wait until I had that time in the summer, which like you said, looking at it that way, it's a very positive thing because I just knew I couldn't, I I was going to be overwhelmed (laughs) and I'm still overwhelmed, but at least I, like you said, I had the downtime with my university job to really go all in. And I think the struggle now is what you're hitting on is that, I'm trying to still be all in with my coaching. I'm trying to continue growing, 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 but I have other restrictions that are making that difficult. So to have a different mindset to say, okay, this is a period where I'm going to maintain things and I'm going to continue to learn, but I'm really going to gear it back up, you know, as I have time with the holidays or with the summer, that's probably a much better sustainable model. I look at this game that we're all playing is just, it's so important to pace a little bit for no other reason than God, the guilt is real. The comparison is real. It can be really hard to overcome that. But a lot of that comes, at least on my end, from, call it an insecurity or um, a lack of awareness of what I really should be doing at that time and place. I mean, I won't show you because it's not public uh, yet kind of what's going on with us personally, but like, In the last three or four weeks, I've had tremendous additional personal demands on my time. And it's been a real challenge. Fine. It's a welcome challenge. But part of that is the acceptance of, I got to pace. Because it will probably be like this for some time. Many months. Uh, And it's all good. You know, everything's great. But I can't... I can't sit here and pretend that I'm going to be able to do what I would normally be able to do uh, professionally with the demands that are on my time personally right now. And I, and I know that I want to be doing this for years to come. And so these periods are always going to come and go for you. At least you can predict them (laughs) to some extent. There's always going to be personal stuff. So, I mean, I, I would, I would look at, you know, Perhaps what some might think of as a curse, you know, full-time job that you love as a blessing. I think, I think when you hit it right, it's going to help you really, really pace this thing and be more sustainable. God, if there's one thing that Jason and I have learned in the 12 years that we've been helping people build online training businesses, it's that very few people are able to stick around for 12 years. And the people that do are never the ones that grow bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah. 
it's a good perspective. The, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look at athletics. Yeah. Right. If you try to get too strong, too big, too quick, look for every single angle, you know, pace yourself, you don't rest, you snap your shit up. <laughs> it's not that different. Anyway, and we're here for you. Um, appreciate it. Appreciate you popping up. Thank you. You got it.